What's Lancing my boils? I'm Robert Evans. This is Behind the Bastards, the show where I talk about terrible people and try out a new intro every week. Uh, Shireen, what, what did you think of that one? Is that is that a winner? Uh, yeah, I'm cringing. Just uh, So I think I, an emotional reaction is what you wanted and you got it. Yeah, yeah, and we we've, we've done extensive market testing, and our our listeners are are huge fans of boils and and yeah. lancings of yeah. boils. Uh, Sophie Sophie brought that info to me last week, so we're trying to play to that demo. Yeah, I mean, I haven't thought about boils in a long time. I'm glad you brought that back to my to my attention. You know, they're they're, they're disgusting. Yep. Make yep. boils be on Shireen's mind again. Uh, I suppose yeah. we've kind of spoiled the fact that our guest today is, is Shireen Lana Yunus from uh, yeah! the Ethnically Ambiguous podcast. Shireen, you got any other plugs to plug up at the start? That's me. That's all I got. Uh, follow me on the socials, and that's all about That's about it. Follow Shirohiro666. There Shirohiro. we go. Follow Shireen on the socials. Now, Shireen, today we are talking about the payday loan industry. Have you ever had to use a payday loan? Uh, fortunately, no. Good, good. Uh, I have not yeah. either. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pretty messed up thing, and uh, today we're going to talk about it for like an hour or so. So I cannot wait for you to teach me all about this thing I know nothing about. <laughs> Excellent. Well, everyone, buckle in, strap your, strap your listening chairs on, throw on your your hearing goggles and uh, prepare to be taken on a journey into the payday loan industry. That was a, that was beautiful. That was thank you. <laughs> thank Am you. I in the magic school bus? <laughs> yes, uh, I, I like to think of every episode of this show as like an episode of the magic school bus, but Miss Frizzle is drunk and abusive. Um, it, it's, are you it's... saying that you are drunk and abusive? Yes. Oh, and you uh, imagine that Miss Frizzle is drunk, abusive, and just has a gun. Yeah. I mean, I do, I do have a gun as well. Yeah. Uh, but no, yeah. I, I hope that the rest of the audience is kind of uh, not the most informed about this topic because I kind of like being a plebe surrounded by plebes, and you can be the Miss Frizzle, you know? Yeah, and I was, I was the plebe until about seventy-two hours ago when I started reading about this. So uh, great, uh, yeah, great, great, exactly. Great. I, it, this is the, this is the slightly less blind leading uh, the blind into the land of eyeglasses i kind of lost the thread of that metaphor we're in the magic school bus where are we going we're going into a payday loan we're going into we're going, we're going into a payday loan store yeah yeah, yeah. so uh i want to start by asking people to think about how weird it is that workers have to wait weeks if not months to get paid for the work that they do Theoretically, your employer benefits from your labor as soon as you do it, whether you're driving an Uber, managing a bank, or using a drone to fire missiles at insurgents or wedding parties in rural Afghanistan. But you, the laborer, don't actually get paid for your work until long after you do it. This is such a normal, accepted part of our system that I don't think most of us ever really talk about it much. And this peculiarity in our labor market has led to the creation of an entire mighty industry, the business of payday loans. Short-term lending, as it prefers to be called by its friends and family, got its start in the United States in the late 1800s. This was the dawn of what we today recognize as normal jobs, where people make a regular salary and get paid on an intermittent basis. Prior to this point, it had been more normal for folks to make a daily wage. If you showed up and worked 12 hours on a farm or a building project or a factory, you walked home with cash in your pocket at the end of the day. Regular, modern-style jobs changed the norms, and this caused problems for workers. Bank accounts didn't really exist for normal people in the late 1800s, and it was common for them to run out of money between paychecks because they'd have medical emergencies or things would break or whatever. Uh, And short-term loans evolved as a way to keep the emerging blue-collar working class alive in the gaps between payday. So it starts, like you can see, in kind of this normal space. It's like people are getting Mm -hmm. paid differently. So they need, you know, uh, a little bit of money now and then to like help them help them bridge the gap between, uh, you know, yeah. their pay cycles, right? Can I raise my hand? I'm raising my hand. Yes, raise your hand. I have a question. That means I have a question. Uh, where does the money come from? Well, it comes from payday lenders. Um, so you would have like normal people wouldn't have credit and like wouldn't be able to get like a loan from a bank. Like a bank's not going to give you a loan if you need three hundred bucks to make up a hole in your, uh, mm-hmm. uh, in your, in your, like budget or whatever so instead these companies come in and basically front you you know 300 bucks but so they're like private companies they're yeah private private lenders private so lenders like, but essentially like a rich person yeah that's giving... that's literally how it was in some cases is just yeah. like someone with enough money to like throw out loans 
And okay. because they're small loans, like a normal loan, like, you know, 6% would be a lot of interest to pay. Um, but uh, because these are small loans and they're very short term, they had like mm-hmm. way higher rates of interest. So a one le- week loan would regularly be somewhere between 120 and 500% APR. Um, uh. Yeah. So th- now we're talking the 1800s still, and that seems insane, but those rates are actually really low compared to the modern equivalents in payday loans. So like today's payday loans will regularly top 500% in interest. Um, yeah. So that, that seems like it might be a little bit abusive, right? Yes. Yes, it would. Now, uh, this is where we get the term loan shark. Uh, the, that's what, how these people came to be known, primarily because they got essentially famous if you would like watch a lot of old TV shows from the 40s and 50s that would show loan yeah. shark characters. Like, you know, you, you've heard the story about like the mob guy threatening to break someone's legs or whatever if they don't pay a debt, right? Of course. Yeah, of course. That happened from time to time, but the reality is that they more often relied on wage garnishment, public embarrassment, or what was called bawling out. Uh, which is less fun than it sounds. It's basically sh- screaming at someone to shame them into paying. What the fuck? <laughs> what? Yeah. That's that's like just public humiliation. Yeah, that's exactly how um, most of the payday loan industry worked in the late 1800s, was um, if you didn't pay, they would try to humiliate you. That's like psychological torture. It's like psychological manipulation. It is psychological manipulation, but does it does it change your opinion on this at all, Shireen, to learn that uh, this actually created a great job opportunity for women in the workplace? Slightly. You know, keep, keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to quote from a scholarly commons article. Quote, to compel payment, salary lenders pestered debtors incessantly at home or sent ballers out to make a scene at work or processed wage assignments or used the powers of attorney they had taken to confess judgment for, before justices of the peace. They did not have to lay a hand on customers in arrears to do a profitable business. Indeed, many firms had a preference for hiring women as loan agents because, as one news story explained, they give an appearance of harmlessness to the lending establishment and an outraged borrower is not so anxious to kick the manager out of a window if she is a woman. So, so it wasn't necessarily for the benefit of women, but for no, the benefit of them. Yeah, it, it was just because you wouldn't beat up a loan shark who was a lady. Sick. Um. Well, as much as I really appreciate job opportunities for women, uh, I mean that's problematic as shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, pro- pro- I, w- I would say problematic as shit is fair. Um. So. Starting after the Civil War, what were called chattel mortgage lenders became increasingly common. So these were payday loans backed up by the debtor's furniture and family possessions as collateral. The explicit goal of the arrangements uh, offered was to trap debtors in an endless cycle, where they would never quite pay off their loan and thus would spend the rest of their lives racing to pay off the interest in order to avoid literally losing their bed. So people would like mortgage their furniture in order to make ends meet for a couple of weeks. That's so sad. That's like... I mean, I feel like it just boils down to a rich person taking advantage of a poor person that's desperate. That's yeah. all it boils down to. Yeah. And that's so sad. Yeah. That is essentially like the rich person the whole ha- must have, I mean, the rich person must have better things to do, but well, no. They're I just mean, greedy. They want money. And it's, this but is they really already good way have to it. Money. Yeah, but, but they you already know, have it. They want more. So the the term loan shark came up essentially because uh, the very form of the deal trapped the borrower in an endless cycle. So you were essentially like always being like chased yeah. down by the shark. You couldn't escape it. Um, the practice was almost immediately recognized as problematic by various state governments as well as the federal government, and they tried a number of ways to get a handle on the problem. States started by placing what were called ursary caps, uh, and by the 19-teens, most states limited annual interest at between 18 and 42%. So this seems a lot fairer than 150 to 500%, right? Um, and right. it would stop people from getting trapped in unsustainable unsust- cycles of debt, but it also kind of wiped out the entire short-term loan industry. Um, Mm -hmm. See, the only way that these loans could work was by giving relatively small amounts of money to people with no credit. By definition, their consumer base had a high default rate. A lot of people would just completely fail to pay their debts. So the only way the industry could be profitable was to charge these high rates of interest. When the government capped that, loan sharks didn't go away, but they did change. The endless debt cycles and ballings out were replaced by mafia men who would offer illegal loans and ensured repayment by beating the ever-loving shit out of clients who failed to pay. So that's... That solves a problem. (laughs) The solving the problem forever. Um, 
No. So, so you're so you're saying this is all stemming from the fact that people don't get paid by the day as much as they do every other week or every month or whatever. Yes, and that's like one of the things you have to remember at the core of this issue is that no matter how fucked up the payday loan industry is and seems, people still need them. Um, because yeah. like they, you know, they have no money for nine or 10 days and their kid has to go to a doctor or like they have a is it, Isn't that, that something that we should tackle? Is seems it, like it. Youth? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Certainly, it certainly seems like it. Um, but we're, we're not, um, why would we tackle systemic problems, uh, in our economic system no. as opposed to just covering up a bandaid or like a, like your, your knee gets gashed open and you're just like worrying about the, the blood trickling on your ankle and not actually the, the wound. It's, that's a gory thing. Yeah. Sorry, Mr. It is, it is a gory situation. <laughs> now. I, I started by saying that, like, the mob guys would beat the shit out of people for not paying loans, and that did happen. But one of the weird things about this story is that the majority of evidence suggests that mafia lenders weren't actually all that bad by the standards of payday loans. Um, like, the more legitimate uh, lenders, they made their money by locking people in an, into an endless cycle of debt. Uh, but they, like, didn't actually beat people up all that often. Uh, and their interest okay. payments were kind of low compared to, like, when legitimate companies would offer payday loans. So I found a great quote on exactly how sort of like physical uh, violence in the loan industry really did work. You know, the stereotype is the mob guy breaking your legs for not paying a debt. That wasn't super common to happen. According to scholarly comments, quote, the debtor is motivated to pay not only because his body is pledged as collateral, but also because he wants to preserve his only line of credit. The creditor, in turn, wants to avoid the expense of hiring a nutcracker to collect the debt. As a 1960s Chicago juice man, that's what they called people who beat people up for loans, explained, Jesus fucking Christ. The cost of hiring a thug to break a deadbeat's leg might exceed the sum he owned. Uh, owed, and with a broken leg, it would be hard for the debtor to own money and catch up on his payments. Imposing a less debilitating penalty usually made more sense. A finger deliberately slit open with a razor blade never kept anybody from working, and serves as a constant reminder of the next payday. But the best strategy, this loan shark insisted, was to select customers carefully and not load them with excessive debt. When business is good in a smoothly run operation, muscle is seldom needed for collections. One of the few empirical studies of a mob loan shark operation confirms this view. Based on FBI case files, the study reported that interviews with 115 customers of the loan business turned up only one debtor who had been threatened. None were beaten. So. I mean, I feel like I've watched enough Sopranos to know that's not true, but um, I'm just kidding. No, I think it's also very interesting that it went from psychological manipulation and torture to the complete opposite, just like pure physical. Yeah. And Isn't that fascinating? That's fascinating. Like, it's weird how that happens, how like when the businesses are completely legal and the legal system allows them. They psychologically torture you and charge utterly ruinous rates of debt or of interest. And then when the business is illegal, the interest rates go down, but they have to slice open your finger to get you to pay sometimes. And like, that's that, like you, you have to pick one of the two, like, cause people are going to get these loans either way. (laughs) I mean, it's a little bit still psychological cause you said something like, um, cutting a finger like it'll be a constant reminder of your debt because it's like on your hand so that's yeah, a little bit still psychological yeah, yeah yeah that's so fucking manipulative it is i mean i gotta say i i kind of i'm, I'm more on the mob side than the legitimate lenders oh it, like, same here yeah no same here i think i think ultimately uh, even though the mobsters are probably better off like financially i feel like for the majority of the time mobsters kind of came from lower class or like middle class air like you know what i mean they're so they working might have a class better understanding. people yeah yeah they, they're they have a better understanding of maybe the desperation they feel or like the 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 trials and tribulations of not having a lot of money and also i mean tony soprano is a complicated character you know um <laughs> this is just i'm gonna turn into the soprano's episode tony so. soprano put in a 40-hour work week every week you know yeah he, he, he wasn't was he wasn't slacking off like certain unnamed presidents Losing a billion Yeah, I mean, like, he was fucking years. around, sure. He was yeah. fucking around and, like, whatever. But at the same time, he's a busy man. And I think I mm-hmm. think that's the difference. I think that's the difference because uh, legal operation is usually run by rich people that usually don't lift a finger for their money. Exactly. Or maybe they don't anymore. Maybe they have in the past where their f- daddy did or whatever. But Tony Soprano, working guy. Yeah, that's why I have a lot more respect for, like, 
a drug dealer than one of these guys who worked at like a mutual fund or whatever, scamming exactly. people out during the financial crash. Someone who was like, we're going to Wells Fargo selling people yeah. uh, bad loans. Like, at least the drug dealer, like they're, you know, for one thing, it's an honest transaction. You want some heroin, you mm-hmm. get some heroin. And for another thing, like they're out there pounding the ground. They're working, working, working the floor, so to speak. They're putting on some risk. I, 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 I you got to respect that more than you respect the financial criminal. So I feel the same way about the mafia mafia in this case. Like, yeah, maybe you're cutting open some people's fingers, but at least that's honest finger cutting work. Yeah, that's honest finger cutting work. Honest finger cutting work. Now, by the 1960s, it was not uncommon for mafia lenders to offer annual APRs of under 200% for their short-term loans. FBI studies also reported surprisingly low rates, given the industry, often around 150% APR. In many cases, mob loans were less than half as expensive as modern payday loans. Uh, Now, as I stated, violence was not the norm, but cases did occur that were shocking enough to spark public outrage. In one incident in 1935, a young clerk was beaten within an inch of his life for welching on a debt. This launched a series of investigations by Thomas Dewey, the governor of New York. 27 people were arrested for violent collection of debts. Throughout the 1940s and 50s, U.S. states cracked down on mafia loan sharks. And unfortunately, they did so by doing the opposite of what they'd done to kill the nonviolent loan sharks, raising usury caps and allowing legal lenders to charge exorbitant interest rates once again. So, by the 1970s, deregulation of the payday loan industry had largely starved the mob out of the business and allowed a thriving new industry of perfectly legitimate companies charging 5 and 600% interest for short-term loans. Uh, individual states realized pretty quickly that this was even worse than letting the mob give people loans, and so they started to change their laws back and reintroduced caps to interest rates. But the big banks had gotten a taste of how much money payday loans could provide. They brought out their lawyers, and in 1978, the Supreme Court ruled on a case in Minnesota. That state had had imposed strict laws on the interest that could be charged on loans, but banks from other states with higher limits had started coming in and operating payday loan businesses, charging the interest rates of their state of origin. When the case hit the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court ruled that this behavior was totally fine, and from now on, banks would partner with short-term lending companies to charge outrageously high interest rates for short-term loans, regardless of what the original indivi- or what the individual states themselves had on the books. As a result of this, certain states, like Kansas and Nevada, became the hubs for increasingly enormous payday lending businesses. So that's cool. What a twist. Yeah, what, what a twist. What a twist. So... By the early 1990s, the payday loan industry was growing at an exponential rate. It had gone from the purview of shady but ultimately human mobsters to a multi-billion dollar business run by gigantic faceless corporations that hid behind a multitude of names and constantly moved across state lines to make their questionably legal behavior harder to prosecute. Again, it's kind of a mark of where the story's going that we're going to look back on the old days of the mafia cutting up people's fingers as the uh, the good old days of payday lending. Yeah, I mean... It's crazy that throughout like basically over a century of this, yeah, no one's been ever on been like, let's just let's just get to the root of the problem. Like what why do people keep wanting money or needing money rather? It's because of the the dis- the, the time between their paychecks. And that's infuriating that that hasn't even been addressed. It's just the the payday loan fucking clusterfuck keeps getting more clusterfucky yeah and nobody nobody ever even talks about like well maybe we should reform how workers get paid because maybe people deserve to get their money the the day that they earn it because why wouldn't they like it's like the only reason it seems weird to suggest that change to us is because it's not how it works um but like if you try to think back on it like well why does the company get the value of your labor immediately but you have to wait weeks or months to get the money that you yeah, earn. Yeah, when you put it that way, it's fucking bullshit. <laughs> it's total it's fucking, fucking bullshit. bullshit. Yeah. Like, what if I what if I work an, an immense amount of work, and then I die the next day? I have no, like, you know what I mean? Like, they have benefited, but I have not. Yeah, exactly. You should be able to... And I'm owed on my deathbed. Yeah. That's yeah. bullshit. And they gotta bury a bunch of money in your casket, which isn't gonna help you any, and it'll probably take I mean, a like, long time. I mean, like, okay, I'm freelance, so I've never actually had like a salary full time job. But the I like I work on a day rate when I work in production or like whatever as a filmmaker, you get like a standard rate sometimes. But even that, it's it's like weeks after the job is over that you finally get paid. And I'm wondering, like, 
maybe there are some things that are like, well, the budget, like, I don't, I don't know, man. What's the, I don't think there's no, there's no solving this. There's no, is, oh my God. Yeah. There, there are some <laughs> companies, there, there's a, 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 one company based out of the Bay Area that's trying to like reform the system. And the way they, they're mm-hmm. trying to do it is by essentially, if you work for a company like Uber or Lyft, um, you sign up a thing with them and basically they pay you what you earn when you earn it. And they take like 1%, like a flat rate, uh, and you get your money instantly. And then when the company pays you, the money goes to the company that has been giving you your money. So like essentially, oh. um, yeah, so like there are attempts. like, But we, also, is it because of taxes? I don't know because it, it, I, I can't. It can't be in most cases because, like you, I've spent most of my working career as a freelancer. Yeah, usually getting paid four to six weeks after I do the work, uh, mm-hmm. and they don't take any taxes out. That's like how freelancing works. So, it. I think it's just a system that was set up because it really benefits the companies that employ us. Um, and that has been going on for so long that most people don't ever think about how messed up it is that they've got to wait a month to get their money. Yeah. Yeah. You're right. But then at the same time, I'd like, I mean, maybe I've worked on too many indie indie film shoots, but like when I hire someone as a sound person or whatever, I try to pay them like, if not after the work day, like within the next morning or the day after that. So it's like, I feel like when you're not married to the system, when you're not thinking this is the only way it has to be, then you're more open-minded. Like, I've never had a salary job where I had to wait a couple of weeks. So in my mind, I was like, well, they worked for me all for 12 hours today. I will pay them. You know what I mean? So I think maybe we're just, maybe the majority of people are just, they think this is the way it has to be. Yeah. It's and not I, true. We got to break free, man. It's not. I mean, to go back to, to the noble drug dealer, you know, when I was, uh, when I was a, a very a poor young dealer. man, the only friends of mine who ever had cash on hand were the ones who made their living selling drugs because you get paid yeah. as soon as you uh, provide a service if you're, yeah. if you're a drug dealer. Yet another reason uh, all of business should take a hand out of the, or leaf out of the book of dealing drugs. Yeah. What if everything yeah. worked like drugs? Okay. But then The Wire, to bring it back to television, I mean, not, it doesn't end well for a lot of people. I, I only know? watched no. the first episode of The Wire, but it seemed like it was going pretty... Well, you're wrong. <laughs> well, you're wrong. You need to watch The Wire. <laughs> does, it, does it go to a dark place? That's unfortunate. Well, first of all, it's an amazing show. But also, like, I understand... I mean, I, I keep bringing up TV because I think it's funny to, like, think that my only inf- source of information about drugs or, or the mafia are from television. But at the same time, not false. Um, but I do think it is a very insightful way to understand... I don't know. Like, uh, how else do we learn? It's just from film and television, and that's how the, 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 me- the word gets out? Yeah, that's... But I think this episode is just trying to tell you all that burn the system down dealing a shot just give drug dealing a shot oh i mean that that too i was gonna say burn the system down but you know what our listeners shouldn't burn down shireen ad breaks the 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 wonderful companies that support our our uh, our show with products and services don't what if a payday loan ad came on right after this then i'm sure it's a completely ethical payday loan company uh just like completely ethical company coke industries who advertised on our show uh, Are who, you shitting me? Love. Oh, no, we love Why Coke Industries. Why am I here? Shireen, you were just telling me the other day, Robert, I really have a lot of crude oil that I need refined. <laughs> Do you know anyone who can refine my crude oil and put out more than twice as much carbon into the atmosphere as other crude oil refineries? And I oh, said- that was verbatim what I said. I, I know, exactly. And and Coke Industries, that that's your, that's your go-to. You're not wrong. Yep. You're not wrong. You know what else isn't um, wrong? Products! We're back! We're talking about payday loans. When we when we last uh, uh, finished at least reading into the script, we'd gotten to the point where the Supreme Court in 1978 ruled that banks could essentially charge whatever interest rates were legal mm-hmm. in their states of origin, uh, but extend loans to people in other states that put on you know different caps on interest rates. Um, and this is sort of responsible for the uh, meteoric rise of the modern payday uh, loan industry. 
So, by the late 1990s, rates of between 200 and 500 percent had become the norm. Lenders began tacking on additional service fees to get around limits on the amount of interest they could charge. By the early 2000s, 11 million Americans spent an average of $500 a year on fees alone. The situation was already out of control, but not so out of control that an extremely gifted grifter couldn't make it out of control here. And this brings us to a little guy named Scott Tucker. You ever heard of Scott Tucker, Shireen? Sounds like a motherfucker. No. Scott Tucker is a motherfucker. Uh, he was originally going to be the subject of this entire episode. Um, he's not the father of payday loans, but I think it might be accurate to call him like the stepfather who moves in when you're already 16 and shares his Miller Tall Boys with you. He's the that guy of uh, of of. Does the he like look at industry. you funny when you wear shorts in the house and like? Yes. Like a cr- yeah. Yeah, and he never he never cri- quite crosses the line, but in a way, just making the comments is crossing the line. But like, you can't right. do anything actionable because your mom's really into him. He's that he's that guy of the payday loan industry. Like you maybe like got some food on your like next to your lip and he like just uses his thumb to take it off without saying anything to you and yeah you have goosebumps everywhere and you have to keep it to yourself for the rest of your life and then maybe they have a kid and then that kid has no idea that his dad is a fucking creep yeah he that that you you really have a feel for Scott Walker uh <laughs> you said you said Scott Walker but you didn't mean oh, Scott Tucker Scott Tucker sorry that's another piece of shit named Scott not a great name uh, no not a great name. Scott Free is the way to beat. That's an advertising for tape. <laughs> Scott was born on May 5th, 1962 in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, he attended Rockhurst High School in Kansas State University, where he studied business administration. Two years into that degree, he decided he'd learned enough about business, so he dropped out of school and went into business for himself. In 1988, he borrowed $50,000 from the American Bank of Kansas City, offering what he said was his new Porsche as collateral. Now, the reality is that Scott did not own a Porsche. He had briefly, but he'd sold it in order to fund his scams and just lied to the bank that he still had it. Tucker's business plan was to use the money he acquired from this real loan to fund a fake loan business. According to the Center for Public Integrity, quote, while a partner in Oregon ran newspaper and magazine ads throughout the country offering commercial loans, Tucker posed as the president of a seemingly high-powered investment bank in Overland Park called Chase, Morgan, Stearns, and Lloyd. The operation was a fraud, collecting more than $100,000 in advance fees from at least 15 borrowers without providing any loans. So his first loan business doesn't actually give people loans. He's, he's just stealing money. Um, wow. And, and kind of stealing the, uh, the name of J.P. Morgan and Chase, as well yeah, as Bear right? Stearns and Lloyds of London. But I don't feel so bad about that because all of those companies are terrible. Um, but that is what he's yeah. doing. Now, Tucker wasn't do only... You, do you only have me on to talk about like shitty white men grifters? Yes. Is that why I'm here? Okay. Yes. You're my, you're, my, you're, you're my shitty white men grifters. Get, I mean, a- immediately after this episode, we're going to about, talk about Jacob Wool again. So, <laughs> I cannot wait to bring up that motherfucker again. So, Tucker wasn't only a major crimes kind of guy. In 1989, while he was in the middle of his stealing money from people and pretending to run a loan company business, he got in trouble for writing bad checks to a moving company he hired to move loads of used furniture for another one of his businesses. This kind of sloppiness ensured that Tucker was quickly caught committing tens of thousands of dollars in fraud. He was convicted in 1991 and spent a year in prison. Now, the next five years of Tucker's life are a little bit of a mystery. He either kept his nose clean and obeyed the law for half a decade, or he got up to a series of smaller-scale grifts and he wasn't caught for them. Whatever the truth, by 1997, he was ready to get back into the major crimes game. That year, he met Charles Hallinan, generally referred to as the godfather of payday loans, although that isn't quite true, as we've gone over already. But Hallinan was wildly successful at running a series of shady, quasi-legal companies operating under the lending laws of one state while offering loans in completely different states. Because con men instinctively recognized their own, Hallinan instantly liked Tucker. The two became fast friends, and Hallinan saw the young man as a protege. He agreed to loan Scott Tucker $500,000 to create a payday lending company. Tucker would be president and run the business from Overland Park, Kansas. As part of the deal, Tucker signed a contract promising not to create any competing payday loan companies. I'm sure that that's going to go well. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Two con men just shaking hands. They're so, so what a pure friendship. What a pure friendship. I am sure neither of them will take advantage of the other. Yeah. Let's read the next paragraph. Hallinan and Tucker inked their deal in September of 1997. Tucker instantly started a new company, CLK Management, in direct violation of the contract he'd just signed with his mentor. He began shuffling assets over from the company he created with Hallinan to his new business. 
Next, Tucker built up a network of dummy corporations based out of Carson City, Nevada, which he could use to receive money from the network of payday lending businesses he established at the same time. Within a couple of weeks, Tucker was running through a convoluted series of businesses lending companies with names like Cash Advance, Preferred Cash Loans, and United Cash Loans. For years, Tucker kept Hallinan in the dark about the fact that he'd basically used the other man's money to build up a payday loan empire that he was the sole beneficiary of. He called his friend every Saturday and gave him updates on their company, which was actually the fakest of his fake companies. He assured the other man that CLK management was just a part of their new lending service. The reality, however, is that Tucker had done something new and completely unprecedented in the world of scammy payday loans. The standard for Hallinan and other payday lenders was to base your company in states like Nevada and Kansas that allowed cripplingly high rates of interest to be charged. Then, thanks to the Supreme Court, they could offer loans to people in states like California with stronger laws in place. But even the states with the loosest ursary laws still had some laws about that kind of thing. And some laws was too many laws for Scott Tucker. He realized that Native American reservations offered a unique opportunity. They got to no! pass... <laughs> Leave them alone! Leave them alone! Yeah, yeah. How did they white man no no they have not now they're getting sucked into one of his grifts uh oh, for literal pennies on the dollar fucker yeah yeah so native american reservations could pass their own laws about like ursary levels and stuff mm-hmm. uh and scott tucker found that if he basically convinced reservations without laws about these things uh to let him operate companies out of their land and offered them a token bribe well then he could really really get into fucking over some poor people so wow yeah He's an innovator. You love innovators. Wow. That's what built this country. Yeah, I, I love innovators. I mean, yeah. I mean, this country was literally built by innovative people finding innovative ways to take advantage of Native Americans. So, like, he's he's really he's he he's just following the steps of his ancestors. Yeah. Really. Yeah. Yeah. Scott Tucker, the 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 junior, 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 the fourth, the fifth, whatever. He's just following in the footsteps. Of his, sh- his shitty fucking scum relatives. It's a noble tradition. That made him a noble tradition. Noble. Yes. Take that back, <laughs> noble, <laughs> Mister Frizzle. What? Well, Sorry, that's her name now. I mean, look, it, all all Tucker is doing, like Shireen, five hundred percent APR is clearly not enough to be charging people for short term loans. So he had to find some way to get that number above seven hundred percent. And using Native American reservations was the only way to do it. Like I, th- that seems perfectly ethical to me. Um, I'll I'll be right back. I'm just gonna go jump out of this window really quick. It's fine. I'm just gonna jump out of the balcony. Yeah, and I'm I'm just gonna set up a little business on a Native American reservation near my but also, house. But and... also, mm-hmm. but also, it's like, how much money is enough for these fucks? You know what I mean? Like, you're already rich. You're already benefiting and and profiting off of people that are so much less fortunate than you and less privileged than you. Like, how much is enough? Why can't these greedy fucks just just well be fucking satisfied? We'll get to why he couldn't be satisfied with the amount of money he had in a little bit, Shireen. Because Scott Tucker's got got some big plans for the money he's grifting out of people. I don't want to oh. don't want to make it think like he doesn't have he doesn't have some ambitions here. So uh, is he investing in becoming a DJ or something or like getting <laughs> kind of? He he's does the very rich person equivalent of becoming a DJ. Um, oh, but no. we'll get to that in just a second. So, okay. uh, according to the Kansas City Star, Tucker's businesses, quote, operated under brand names including Ameriloan, Cash Advance, One Click Cash, United Cash Loans, and 500 Fast, Ca- Fast Cash. In addition to steep interest rates, authorities said consumers were tricked by t- the terms of the loan through renewals and fees. A $500 loan could result in the borrower owing $1,925. So, that's the kind of like level of grift we're we're talking about like your kid gets a medical bill and you need 500 bucks to cover the debt and then uh, you know in a month or two you wind up owing 2 grand to Scott Tucker because wow you don't know how to read a contract as well as Scott Tucker's lawyers know how to write one um wow and because he's operating out of native american land it doesn't matter what the laws are in your state um, Damn. Yeah. So that's fun. Over the years, Tucker turned a $500,000 investment into a $2 billion a year business with more than 4.5 million annual customers. This meant his companies accounted for roughly 40% of the 11 million Americans who used payday loans. 
Now, Tucker did, of course, attract legal attention, but it wasn't immediately clear that Scott Tucker was actually behind any of his companies. Regulators wound up fighting his front businesses, never realizing that they were all essentially disposable shell companies, arms of the same octopus. Now, Kansas was the first state to attempt to do something about one of Tucker's companies, a payday lender called Cash Advance. Back in the early aughts, they went after it for deceptive practices that led to Kansans illegally being charged almost 800% interest in short-term loans. According to the Center for Public Integrity, quote, Danny Vopat, the lead attorney in the case for Kansas bank commissioner, says he never knew that Tucker, living and working in the same state, was actually behind the payday lenders he battled for more than two years. Vopat settled with one of Tucker's shell companies in Nevada, a shell that no longer exists. Tucker quickly abandoned the trade name Cash Advance. For these reasons, Vopat says it's unclear that Tucker would violate the settlement agreement if he started lending in Kansas again. So you see, because of the way all these shell companies are set up and where they're located, it's kind of impossible for anyone to go after him, like state-level governments. It's the same reason right. why, like, a drug enterprise, you would want to have people located in different states doing different things, mm -hmm. because it disrupts law enforcement. Like, it, it just makes it Whoa. impossible to catch. So, mm -hmm. Tucker did keep lending in Kansas, just under new companies with new names. His businesses were all run from Overland Park, in a massive 600-person office. But in order to keep up the illusion that these were Native American-run businesses, Tucker's employees were given daily weather, weather reports from the tribal lands where they were supposed to be based. This way, they could more effectively lie to borrowers. It took until 2005 for any state authorities to even learn that Scott T uh, to even learn the name Scott Tucker. This is because wow. he... Yeah, well... It's because he hired an actor to pretend to be the CEO of his business and to register all the shell no! companies he made. Yeah, yeah. Now, no! Fucking love, like, the the beginning of, like, well, actually, no. JT Leroy was nothing like that. But but what is it with... I'm just mad. Yeah, well, I mean... I, you... I always get so mad on your fucking show, Robert. I mean, I'm always mad. But, Shireen, does it change your mind to know that it's not illegal to do that in the state of Nevada? <laughs> I don't fucking care about what's illegal or not in this fucking country. Obviously, we're fucked. Yeah, yeah. So I miss Tony Soprano. Yeah. It, it, I know he's not real. Yeah, it's, it's amazing that Tony Soprano was breaking the law, but Scott Tucker wasn't. I mean, he was actually, but at this point, he wasn't. Um, so when this con came to light and the Colorado, Colorado Attorney General subpoenaed him, Tucker was not charged with any crime because it wasn't illegal to have a fake person pretend to be the CEO of the company. Who was the where, actor? Uh, it was, was just, just some, some guy he hired. schmuck? Yeah, it was just some schmuck. He just needed a name and, that wasn't and he his. Would, and what would he do? He would just like appear at places that Tucker was supposed to be at? No, no, it wasn't even that detailed. He would just register, like sign his name when they were registering the new companies. And like, oh. yeah, like it was that simple. Like he just wanted a name that wasn't Scott Tucker on all this stuff. So it was that much harder to come after him. Oh, I see. Yeah. So. Uh, years later, one of Tucker's former employees laid out under oath exactly how many of these shell businesses Tucker operated. Quote, in addition to owning one click cash, CLK also owned or was affiliated with Amerilone, U.S. Fast, Fast Cash, United Cash Loans, Preferred Cash Loans, and Internet Cash Advance Marketing. I understand that there are at least 500 internet-based payday lending companies that are currently affiliated with one of the five companies mentioned uh, above owned by CLK. Um, so this employee was witness to some of the unspeakable human cost of Tucker's empire of debt. He later reported under oath, I often saw a customer loan of $300 turn into a $900 debt in a very short period of time due to interest, rollover, and late fees. He estimated that 60% of the money he brought in during a given month came from the interest, rollover, and late fees rather than the customer paying down the principal balance. So again, wow. the business isn't people paying down their balance. The business is conning them into paying extra money through mm -hmm. late fees and, and service charges and whatnot. Yeah. And for a very long time, Tucker's payday lending business did spectacularly well for him. He netted somewhere around $400 million, and that's just the money we can verify. He bought a $1.3 million Ferrari, an $8 million house in Aspen, and a $1.8 million house in Kansas. Most of his ill-gotten riches, however, were spent on his true passion. You want to guess? You want to guess what it is, Shireen? You want to guess what 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 this guy's equivalent of becoming a DJ is? Um, <laughs> let me think. Maybe singing or like some type or no, no. He wanted to be a arcade master. No, no. I mean that is kind of close because a lot of arcades have racing games, and Scott Tucker wanted to be a race car driver. What? That's the most. That's the whitest dream I've ever fucking heard of. 
Yeah. If you look him up on Wikipedia, his name is even given as Scott, Scott Tucker, parentheses, racing driver. Um, no! And he wasn't, you say it's the whitest thing ever. Can't change his dream? It's, it's, it's really not. Um, because but he, it is. he doesn't get involved in the honest, God-fearing, beer-soaked kind of races that like NASCAR fans watch. He did prestige, fancy races in like Europe and shit, like the Ferrari Challenge and the Rolex Sports Car Series and the American Le Mans Series. Like he didn't even do like the honest, drunken NASCAR rally kind of races. Like he was, he was really in like the stupid, fancy, rich guy, uh, multi-million-dollar car sort of thing. I have a question. Yes. Is this guy married or or with anybody or is he fucking? Yeah, no, he was married (sighs) to some broad. What is humanity? Mm -hmm. What is now? So if we just show me a picture of him, he's gross. Yeah, he's a gross-looking guy. He's a fucking droopy-ass motherfucker. His face is like melting on either side. Yeah, he looks like like a young Jeff Gordon if Jeff Gordon had wandered too close to a candle. Now, he does seem to have been a, a pretty decent race car driver. Like, at least he won some races, and he was Rookie of the Year at one point. I don't think he was, like, super good, but I, I don't have any real ability to rate race car drivers. Um, he seems, from what I've read, like he was sort of on the edge of where he might have been good enough to drive professionally if he hadn't had hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, but he probably wouldn't have ever established a racing career if he hadn't had hundreds mm-hmm. of millions of dollars. Now... The term used within the racing community for dudes like Scott is a gentleman driver, and that's essentially racing lingo for a rich guy who buys a really fancy car and is able to become a professional race car driver because they're rich for some other reason. Okay, yeah. So gentleman driver Scott Tucker was well-known within the racing community, and he verged on being famous outside of Kansas. Curiously, he did no racing inside the state of Kansas and seems to have gone out of his way to avoid attracting any attention there. Articles I've read that interviewed people on the racing scene are mixed about Tucker. Some of his fellow racers said that he was very good, but Gunnar Jeanette, who finished runner-up to Tucker in a 2010 race, was less positive. Here's This American Life. Quote, Jeanette said he didn't like the manner that Chucker to- Tucker chose to win the championship. He cheated really well inside of the rules, which maybe says a lot about his character, says Jeanette. Uh, he adds that Tucker was a detail-oriented racer who found loopholes. For the first time in series history, he got them to allow him to get points in whichever car finished better. It was very difficult <sighs> racing against him where he would drive two cars, and basically, if one car had an issue and the other car finished better, he would get points for that, says Jeanette, whose team only fielded one car. Wow. So he was a con man in everything yeah, he did. That's the only thing he knows how to do is be a con man. How you doing? How you doing there, Shireen? Um, my blood is boiling. Let's bring it back to, to the boils. I am I am going to guess that Scott Tucker spent as, at least as much money on his side racing uh career as it would have taken to replace the water systems in Flint, Michigan. <gasps> When you put it that way, when you put it that way, it is disgusting what fucking these grifters do. Like, it's not how selfish and disgusting of a of a person do you have to be deep down to be that f- fucking greedy and selfish and I'm just pissed. I mean, <laughs> but the alternative, Shireen, is that he wouldn't be able to own multiple million dollar Ferraris. And can you imagine I mean, anyone being is, happy that, without that? I mean, that is true. I guess you need one for every day of the week. So yeah, exactly. You can't be seen driving the same one on Monday and Tuesday. Yeah, like a poor person driving a Ferrari wow. in, on two consecutive yeah. days. No, that's, what am I, a peasant? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like some some kind of fucking yeah, yeah dirt farmer. Now, starting in 2008, Tucker began dealing with increasing legal threats to his empire. One of them came from his old mentor, Hallinan. Hallinan claims that, around 2006, Scott's weekly calls stopped and were replaced by occasional emails. Hallinan sent an accountant over to look into their company and found that it had, quote, essentially been ransacked and substantially of all of its assets, cash, and profits diverted. So we realized that this business he'd put half a million dollars into funding had basically been hollowed out by the guy he thought was his partner and all of the money put into establishing an empire of scammy uh, Mm -hmm. uh, payday loan businesses. So, Hallinan sued his former business partner, which had the unhappy side effect of drawing legal attention towards both men who, up until that point, had mostly been insulated due to the structure of their companies. 
In October of 2008, an Olaf County, uh, Kansas deputy sheriff ticketed Scott Tucker for going 86 miles per hour in a 60 mile per hour zone. Here's how a joint investigation between CBS and iWatch News described what happened next. Quote, Two days later, Tucker's wife, brother, sister-in-law, and sister-in-law, as well as several businesses with ties to the payday loan mogul, suddenly donated a total of $4,000 to the campaign of a candidate for local district attorney, the office that prosecutes traffic tickets. Among the businesses that donated $1,000 to the campaign were two payday loan companies that the Miami tribe of Oklahoma claims to own. Weeks later, the ticket was reduced to improper parking to the surprise of the deputy who ticketed Tucker. The charge kept Tucker's driving record clean. Wow! Cool. Cool stuff. Now, cool stuff. The good news is that this lawsuit with uh, Hallahan, his old partner, which was settled out of court, and this uh, bribery of a district attorney candidate to get his charges reduced, these would wind up being the seeds of Scott Tucker's undoing. But before yeah. we get to that, you know what we got to get to right now? Um, well, I was going to jump out of the window after the outbreak or before? Uh, after. Okay, I'll do that after. Okay, we'll be right back. Products! We're back! So I actually am really thrilled because I like that the undoing of this motherfucker was, in fact, uh, it was just their greediness getting the better of them. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's it, kind of how, like, Ted Bundy got caught because he uh, was driving all the times. You know what I mean? Ted Bundy only got caught by police when he was driving stupidly because he doesn't know how to drive, obviously. Yeah. It's, um, it, it, but, I mean, they're not they're not the same type of evil at all. But I'm saying I like when their undoing is done by them. Yeah. You know? I like that too, because it's 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 this kind of thing where like it's not even a serious charge, like going twenty six miles over the speed limit. If that's your only traffic crime, it's not going to get your license taken away or anything like that. Yeah, um, you'll pay a heavy fee, like like fine, but like Scott Tucker could afford that shit. Um, he just mm-hmm. he just it bugged him to not have a perfect driving record because he fancied himself this great race car driver. So uh-huh. he yeah he essentially exposed everything for that and it's yeah that's funny that's really funny in 2011 uh i watch news published an investigation that marked the first time tucker's fraudulent loan empire was laid out in the open now by that point the irs and law enforcement were already interested in tucker's business uh because of the lawsuit with hallinan um and he'd started to claim in public that he no longer had anything to do with any of his payday loan businesses i watch's investigation looked into the structure of his bribes to the uh, kansas district attorney and essentially used that to like lay out the structure of his organization so i'm going to quote from their investigation among the companies that gave $500 campaign donations to the prosecutor on the same day as several of Tucker's relatives were two tribal businesses, AMG Services and m and Services. AMG Services operates out of an office complex in Overland Park, the same office that Tucker lists as his own in Securities and Exchange Commission filings. AMG Services pays the property tax on Tucker's $8 million vacation rental in Aspen, Colorado, according to the county records. One of AMG Services' biggest vendors said in a lawsuit that Scott Tucker in 2009 was the owner and chief officer of AMG Services. Most revealing of all, bank records showed that Tucker and his brother Blaine were the only two people able to sign for four payday lending businesses of one tribe. The tribes may only receive a sliver of the revenue from the payday lending business. So, all this sort of laid out the exact structure of his company, including the fact that he was uh, uh, basically bilking these Native American tribes for their land mm-hmm. and giving them pennies on the dollar. Uh, another yep. class action lawsuit from borrowers in California revealed that the exact amount that these tribes received was between 1% and 2% of revenue from the loans, which again raked in 800% or more in interest. Uh, over the years, 22 different states took Tucker to court with varying degrees of success, but a combination of years of lawsuits and dogged reporting gradually revealed the true face of Tucker's business. In 2014, facing increasing legal challenges, Scott's brother Blaine committed suicide by leaping off the top of a parking garage. I should not make any jokes about jumping out of windows, is no. what I've learned. Well, I mean, a window is not a parking garage, unless that parking garage has windows. Wait, why did he do... I mean, I, obviously, that's a stupid question, but what th- was he involved in the business at all? Yeah, he, both of his brothers were involved in the business, and in fact, one of his brothers got in trouble because the money that they were making sort of legitimately through payday loans wasn't enough, and so he just started 
buying people's information and uh, calling them and telling them that they owed him money and having debt collectors threaten people who hadn't taken out loans. Um, And one of the debt collectors that he hired to do this threatened to rape a guy's wife for not paying a debt that he didn't owe. And so that guy started suing the pants off of Scott Tucker's brothers. And it was was this whole big mess. Um, So What the fuck? Yeah, they, like, Scott Tucker was mostly focused on the uh the 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 basic crimes of of running wait these... so it's it's a fucking family of awful of evil it's not just well him. yeah once Scott Tucker got successful he brought his brothers in and his brothers were even How less many disciplined he have? than him he had two I think two that were involved at least um, too too many Jesus fucking Christ yeah yeah Good riddance whatever way too too many this is uh, the the Tucker family is a great case for why condoms should be free um yeah yeah I agree yeah. Uh, Wait, so after his brother committed suicide, did that change anything? Well, there were a number of federal lawsuits and investigations underway at that point. So his brother's suicide, like, it ended his brother Blaine's problems, but Scott Tucker was still in hot water. And in September of 2016, the Federal Trading Commission hit Scott Tucker with a $1.3 billion civil judgment, the largest ever obtained in a litigated case. Tucker's home and his beloved race cars were all repossessed by the government. It's a real heartbreaker. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, he probably cried about that. I'm that's sure he did. Brilliant. Now that makes me happy. Yeah, it does. I've, I've, I feel happy for the first time today. If you watch, thinking about his race car being taken away and him crying in his garage. I'm. <laughs> yeah, you get to see him be sad in the uh, in Dirty Money, the first episode of that Netflix series, because it's like filmed oh, right a- around when the government was taking all of his shit, and it's it's pretty good. Oh. It's pretty good. Nice. Now, uh, in 2016, as like that same year, uh, a New York grand jury indicted Tucker and a bunch of his business partners for extending deceptive loans, unlawful debt collection, and racketeering. The case revealed that Tucker had actually been charging even more interest than had previously been known. Some of his customers paid upwards of a thousand percent interest on their loans. Tucker a thousand was... percent? <laughs> yeah, a thousand percent. <laughs> I can't even compute that in my fucking plebe brain. What the fuck? A thousand percent? No, I, and it's it's weird that this sentence is something I'm going to literally say, but it's definitely more ethical to just cut people's fingers open. Like, uh, yeah. I agree with you. I've never agreed with you more. Yeah, yeah. Wild that that's the case. So yeah. Tucker was sentenced to 16 years in prison for running a $3.5 billion criminal empire. That same year, Tucker's mentor, Hallinan, was convicted of collecting more than $492 million in illegal debt. He was sentenced to 14 years in prison. But, Shireen, if you're thinking the bust of two major payday loan scammers meant the industry itself was in for hard times, think again. Were you, were you thinking that? Or did I just script I, I, that I mean, for no reason? I, I know that there are still payday loan companies that exist now, so I, I, I'm no, I know that their end or their demise or their fucking decade of vacation time in prison didn't mean the end of the payday loan companies. But um, you would think... The, I mean, in a, in a in a world that is better than the one we live in, you would think that evil people in control of payday loan companies would at least learn from these evil people's mistakes, right? You would think and, that, but no. I mean, they learn from their mistakes in that they don't commit as obvious a crimes, but they do continue mm-hmm. to do the same terrible things. So it didn't. It didn't lessen. It didn't lessen it at all. Like no one. No one was scared to scared enough to change their ways. No. Uh, and in fact, the region of Kansas that Tucker worked in, specifically like around Kansas City, like the wealthy neighborhoods there, became sort of a uh, a haven for the payday loan industry because of local laws in that regard. And suddenly, like anybody with enough cash to open up a business, um, was able to create online payday loan companies that just funneled huge amounts of money into neighborhoods like Mission Hill in Kansas around Kansas City where like the very wealthiest people in Kansas lived Uh, I found an article published a year after the FTC indicted Scott Tucker Um, it quotes several attendees at Catholic churches uh, in wealthy areas most notably St. Anne's and Mission Hills um, about sort of how the payday lending industry flushed the area with cash around 2013-14 um, one worshiper recalled, quote, it was most obvious at the school auctions. You'd see these clicks of people pulling up in limos, acting wild, dropping a lot of money on exotic two-week vacations and the other lavish items up for bidding. Or all of a sudden, so-and-so has a brand new Range Rover or so-and-so family is moving into some giant Mission Hills mansion. You see it enough times and you start to go, where is this money coming from? 
And on one hand, it's St. Anne. This is a school and a church that serves Mission Hills and Prairie Village. You expect to see nice cars in the parking lot. But there was something so sudden and so loud about this. It was this bizarre explosion of really extreme wealth. So David Hudnall is the uh, journalist who wrote this story. Uh, And he pressed Reverend Keith Lunsford of St. Anne as to whether or not he thought taking money gotten from fleecing the poor was a very Christian uh, thing to engage in. And Reverend Lunsford responded, I don't have any firsthand knowledge of anybody at St. Anne involved in the payday loan industry. So he didn't. Isn't, isn't the church just one big giant payday loan industry? Yeah, the when Catholic really church for it. sure. Like, yeah, yeah. And, and, and a lot of the Pentecostal ones as well, um, like Creflo Dollar. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and some of those folks. So I have, a, I, I have an unrelated question when you have a sec. Yeah. My hand is raised. Absolutely. Ask away. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Frizzle. Um, I want to ask, a while ago you mentioned that Tucker worked at a, a building that had like 600 employees. So the, the employees at these companies, are they paid well or are they basically like labor force that are like they might as well be factory workers that get paid the bare minimum and just to survive or at the very least are they paying their workers a decent amount to live you know what i mean some of them were paid very well like the ones whose job was to actually collect debts generally got a portion of those debts and if they were bringing in tens of thousands of dollars a month they lived very well um, as uh, you know, when it came to people that weren't as critical to the business and weren't involved in as much of the shady stuff, I think Tucker probably paid them as little as he could get away with because that's how most of these people tend to work. You see, I was trying to give him the benefit of the doubt that was like, maybe he at least gave some people jobs, but in the end, um, he is unredeemable. So keep going. Sorry for interrupting. I would call him an unredeemable okay, asshole. Cool. Speaking of unredeemable assholes, uh, after the payday loan industry exploded in Mission Hills, St. Anne's Church managed to meet an $8 million fundraising goal. Um, one parishioner told The Pitch, which is the, the, the site I found this article and it covers local Kansas City news, it presented a moral conundrum for St. Anne because there was all this money coming into the church through donations and through the auctions, and I mean it was huge money, and gradually everybody realized that it was money that, if you trace it back to its root, came from poor people who were being taken advantage of, who were being charged crazy interest rates. Mm-hmm. So there were a lot of behind-closed-doors, hushed-tones conversations happening about it. People on the finance committee and the school board were talking about the morality of taking that money, but in the end, I think they just looked the other way way. Now, David Hudnall, the journalist who wrote this story, also went over to a poor part of town and talked to a reverend at a church whose clientele were the victims of rich people who funded the renovations at St. Anne, because David Hudnall's a good journalist. Uh, He talked to Reverend Ernie Davis, who told him, We've seen members of our parish who lost their homes through the snowball effect of payday lending. It has absolutely ravaged the lives of people in our parish. There's no justification for it in the faith we share. Anything that oppresses the poor is condemned in both Jewish and Christian scriptures. People have a sense of what is right and fair, whether it's through scripture or through their hearts, and charging especially poor people hundreds of percent in interest is oppressive. So. Wow. That's fun. Yeah. But was this guy still part of the problem? No, no, this guy this guy led a church in a poorer part of town where like all of his oh, okay, parishioners okay. were losing their houses because of the loans the people at St. Anne's were making millions off wow. of. Wow. Yeah, because okay. it's so Kansas. Not all church is bullshit. So I yeah. guess some people, okay. Just rich some churches. People, yeah, okay, cool. Now, um, keep going, sorry. I bet you're wondering, just, Shireen, how bad is the payday loan industry really? Like, what, what, like what, what do we know statistically about the actual impacts that it has on poor people? Right, like that, 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 that's kind of what I have. I have a couple questions that I've, I've been saving up, but yeah, yeah, uh, well, hey, yeah, drop the questions and then I'll get, I'll, I'll get onto my info. Well, down. well, okay. So, I was thinking credit cards. So you have payday loan industries that supply poor people or desperate people with immediate money then you have credit cards it's very easy to open a credit card as long as you have decent credit i'm sure a credit card will give you credit i mean a credit card company is going to give you a credit card if you're just like passable um so our payday loan industries tackling those that have worse credit that can't have a credit card or that's exactly it it these are for okay. people who can't get credit because they, um, you, I mean, oftentimes because they had credit cards and they like mm-hmm. were really bad with them. Um, but other times just because they've never had any sort of credit history um, because they're very, very poor and they've only ever worked. Like a lot of the people who get payday loans have never had a bank account. You know, they're the kind of people who grew okay. up in the 
poorest parts of town like 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 a lot of them are like uh, black and hispanic people who grew up in very very poor circumstances and have only ever worked sort of cash and hand jobs okay. and who just don't See, i just yeah. i've just showed my privilege thinking that everyone can get a credit card but obviously i forgot that it's a privilege to even consider getting a credit card yeah um, to an, yeah exactly like yeah. the 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 Payday loans are mainly for people who really like credit cards aren't even an option for them because as bad right. as the credit card industry is, it's generally a lot less abusive than the payday loan industry. Yeah, I, I was thinking about that. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, and I guess, I mean, my other one is not really a question, more of a statement, but um, I can save it. Okay, well, let's 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 get on to some statistics. So I decided to look okay. into. I, I wanted to like find all of the research I could on how bad payday loans were and like how they actually impact the poor and communities. Um, mm -hmm. I found a 2014 Consumer Financial, uh, Financial Protection Bureau study uh, that they did on like, they evaluated 12 million payday loans in three states. According to the New York Times, quote, the study discredits once and for all the industry's portrayal of these loans as a convenient option for people who can easily repay the debt on the next payday, customarily in two weeks. In fact, only 15% of borrowers in the study could raise the money to repay the total debt without borrowing again within 14 days. 20% of these borrowers default on a loan at some point, which can result in credit damage and more bank fees, and 64% renewed a loan, sometimes more than 10 times, and had to pay fees that put them on a slippery slope towards debt that would be, would be difficult to repay. Mm -hmm. So Richard Cordray, the director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, described the story of a woman in Pennsylvania who lost her job at a hospital and took out a short-term $800 loan to pay rent. As of the time she spoke to the CFPB, she had paid more than $1,400 on the loan and was still in debt. She was also still being hounded by debt collectors. Wow. Yeah. In 2016, Christine Dobridge of the Federal Reserve conducted a study that found payday loans actually helped families in the wake of natural disasters and other singular issues. Quote, in periods of temporary financial distress, after extreme weather events like hurricanes and blizzards, I find that payday loan access mitigates declines in spending on food, mortgage payments, and home repairs. In an average period, however, I find that access to payday credit reduces well-being. Loan access reduces spending on non-durable goods overall and reduces housing and food-related spending particularly. So it's not an inherently bad thing to offer short-term loans like this to people who have had a disaster hit them, like a hurricane, fuck up their house or whatever. I mean, I, I understand that, but at the same time, if that happened, like if the natural, if a natural disaster did occur and a family or a person needed money immediately, in what, in what world does the majority of these people, like, because they have to pay back the loan pretty much immediately or very sh shortly after they borrow it if so they won't rack up interest. So if they don't have $800 a week ago why would they have it the next week to pay it back you know what i mean like it, it feels like some they would have to borrow from other companies even they would have to like keep having loan after loan after loan unless unless at the, unless like they're they're truly just waiting for their paycheck you know what i mean and if that paycheck can help can help them in the end but I don't know. Just it's a, it's an evil cycle. It is an evil cycle, and like I, I think what what Dobridge found is that like the only people for whom it wasn't an evil cycle were the people with regular paychecks that just got delayed because like something fucked up happened or like you know yeah. the government shut down. Like a lot of people used payday loans. Yeah, yeah. And I'm gonna yeah. guess those people were were less hurt from it than like the very impoverished tended to be. So like the primary yeah, communities preyed on. What studies have found that the primary communities where payday loans uh, operate in are neighborhoods with high minority populations, lower education levels, and more poverty. They're also particularly common uh, in the families of U.S. service personnel. Um, and in fact, studies have found that uh, access to payday loans reduces job performance of soldiers and lowers retentions levels of, uh, of U.S. military personnel as well. Dude, so, that's fucked up. Yeah, that it's super fucked, fucked up. up. Yeah, that like, uh, we, like... We take advantage of the people that are trying to serve us the yeah, most? Yeah, that that's like, the, the, like one of the number one uh, uh, like customer bases of the payday loan industry is soldiers who can't yeah. make ends, ends meet. Yeah, kind of messed up. That's fucked. Yeah, <laughs> It's, I mean, it's already fucked that they take advantage of marginalized people. That's already fucked as it is yeah. because oftentimes communities that are impoverished are by default have a large marginalized community because that's just like the systematic racism at work. But it's that's just layers of fucked up after layers of fucked up. I wait, but are the interest rates any better now or are they just as bad? 
They're better than like Tuck. No one charges what Scott Tucker was charging. You're not seeing thousand okay. percent in- interest rates, but like five to mm-hmm. six something, seven hundred sometimes percent is still pretty pretty normal. I think five hundred percent is more like the norm. But that's a lot. Yes, that's a lot of money. Yes, that's not fair. Here's where things get really convoluted, Shireen. Um, oh, no. Because as I, how could it get worse? Well, because I, I, I was, I wanted to end this with like a big dump of statistics I found on how bad uh, payday loans were, and I, I, I put, okay. I, I already read a few of those to you. I definitely found some, but I also found a bunch of studies saying that they were good uh, and that they don't hurt people and that they don't primarily target minority communities and that. So, you, so you mentioned the the, the natural disasters. Yeah. That was one. So I, I, you know, I, like w- one place I I wound up at was like a website called Journalist Research, which is a, an actually really useful little site that summarizes research on a subject. And they had a bunch of links to like summaries of payday loan studies, about half of which said payday loans were bad, and about half of which sounded like this quote. Uh, Chintal Desai at Virginia Commonwealth University and Gregory Elihausen at federal at the Federal Reserve find that a Georgia ban on payday loans hurts locals' ability to pay other debts. They conclude that payday loans do not appear on net to exacerbate consumers' debt problems and call for more research before new regulations are imposed. So you run into a lot. I ran into a lot of stories like that. Um, as I dug around more, I started to worry that I might have found a mis- made a mistake in focusing on the payday loan industry as a bastard. I found a Freakonomics article titled, Are Payday Loans as Evil as People Say? It cited a lot of that same research and came to the conclusion that actually everything is fine in the payday loan industry and the growing calls to have the government regulated are short-sighted. No, but, I don't believe. Wait, Freakonomics g- benefits in some way. I don't me, trust give me, them. Give me a moment. Give me a moment. Shireen. They're owned by the Koch brothers. Okay. I dug around a little bit more, and then I came across a Washington Post article titled, How a Payday Loan Industry Insider Tilted Academic Research in Its Favor. So, the article uh, starts in 2013, <sighs> when the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, under President Obama, was preparing to lay out a sweeping series of regulations to make the payday lending industry less of an abusive nightmare. Henry Miller, who is an attorney who works in the payday lending industry, reached out to a professor in Georgia and asked if she'd be interested in testing the number one criticism of the payday loan industry, which is that its customers are hurt by its loans. According to the Washington Post, quote, Over the next year, Miller worked closely with Jennifer Lewis Priestley, a professor of statistics and data science at Kennesaw State University, suggesting research to cite the type of data to use, and even lecturing her on proofreading. Punctuation and capitalization are somewhat random, he said in a February 2014 email responding to a draft of the report. You might want to have your maiden aunt who went to high school before 1960 read this. So, what the fuck? I know. He was mansplaining fucking the English language to her? He sure was, and she let him do it because he was giving her a $30,000 grant to publish the study. And this is a different Henry Miller than the one that wrote, like, Tropic of Cancer, right? Yes, this is not the Henry okay. Miller. This is the Henry Miller who is a shill for the payday loan industry. Okay, cool. Uh, Just yeah. another white guy. Yeah, or Hillary. Hillary Miller. Um, yeah, oh, Hil- I thought Hillary you said Henry. Miller, but one L, yeah. Um... Priestley's report ultimately concluded that taking out repeated payday loans did not, and according to the emails, Miller discussed the results with a CFPB economist. It's unclear how it factored into Bureau decisions, but it has been repeatedly touted uh, by payday lending supporters. So basically, Priestley's report concluded that payday loans were actually not bad for people, and that that wound up going to the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau uh, and, and being weighed in on their decisions as to whether or not to regulate the industry. Now, oh my God! Priestley's report is only one of the pro payday loan sources I ran into when I was trying to figure out how bad uh, the industry was. And the post lays out a pretty damning story of industry academic collusion here. In exchange for that thirty thousand dollar grant, Priestley gave Miller and his payday loan industry bosses shocking control over her work. In one December email, Miller asked her to change the way she analyzed data about borrower credit scores. Priestley responded, "I am here to serve. I just want to make sure that what I am doing analytically is reflecting your thinking." The email ended with a smiley face. When the report was pub- yeah. <laughs> when the report was published, it noted that Miller's nonprofit, uh, which was essentially a mouthpiece for the payday loan industry, did not exercise any control over the editorial content of her paper. But when the Post interviewed her, Priestley admitted that she offered to share authorship of the report with Miller, and he declined. 
Now, one of Hillary Miller's goals for his pet academic was to have her attack the idea that payday loans trap people in an unending cycle of debt. A 2014 Consumer Financial Bureau study found that most borrowers are forced to renew their loans so many times that they pay more in fees than the actual amount they borrow. In March of 2014, Miller sent Priestley an email asking her to avoid the term cycle of debt. In general, we do not accept the notion that a cycle of debt even exists, and I would appreciate it if you would delete all references to this term unless you are rebutting its existence. Oh my god. Priestley did as she was asked. (laughs) Who is this asshole I mean that just trotted onto the scene like what she's, where does <sighs> you could almost say she's kind of like the people who are being taken advantage of the payday loan industry and in that she needed a chunk of money quickly and 100% Miller, yeah they took adv- she was she was she was caught in the cycle yeah yeah and they uh I mean I mean they're not charging her interest for the 30 grand uh, I'll I'll give them that but uh well that is still fucked. Shady and, as hell. And that is a that's in modern. That's like recent. That's a recent thing. Like yeah, you were is... researching it the other day, and you. The... <sighs> yeah. Oh, we're like about to get into person, some other person is going to be researching like whether or not they should take out a loan, and they're going to come across an article being like they're not that bad, and then they're going to just it's going to continue. It actually gets a lot more infuriating than that. Oh my god. Okay, let's hear it. So. According to the Washington Post, quote, as the publication of the study neared, Miller congratulated Priestley on her work. Priestley's study found that payday loan customers who repeatedly borrow money over a long period have better financial outcomes than those who borrow for a shorter time. These borrowers also benefited from living in states where payday lending wasn't heavily restricted, the report found. This is a terrific paper, he said in an April 2014 email. When it is done, you are going to be famous and your phone will ring off the hook. The group was developing a strategy for releasing the report, he said. We want them to believe that the results are honest, verifiable, and most importantly, correct. Now, Shireen, if this was just one cooked study, it would be damning, but not damning of all of the different studies that I came across that seem to have positive things to say about the payday loan industry. But of course, it wasn't just one study. The Huffington Post published an article in 2015 that discussed the payday loan industry interference into multiple studies, including a 2011 paper, Do Payday Loans Trap Consumers in a Cycle of Debt? One guess as to the paper's conclusions. Here's the Huffington Post. Quote, The emails show that the payday loan industry gave economics professor Mark Fusaro at least $39,912 to write his paper and paid an undisclosed sum to his research partner, Patricia Cirillo. In response, the industry received early drafts of the paper, provided line-by-line revisions, suggested deleting a section that reflected poorly on payday lenders, and even removed a disclosure detailing the role payday lending played in the preparation of the paper. Fusaro cut two critical findings from his paper at Miller's behest. The first was a finding that payday loan borrowers tended to have frequent debt overdrafts and the uh, debit overdrafts in the period before their loan. This looked bad for the industry because one of their chief claims was that most borrowers could afford the loans. They were stable people dealing with emergencies. Obviously, if people were failing to pay their debts prior to getting a payday loan, then it makes it seem like the payday loan industry is just taking advantage of people who are having financial difficulties. In an email, Fusaro's co-author told him, quote, Hillary called me the other day for an update. I told him about where we were in data collection and also this other finding. I suspect he isn't too happy about that finding and pointed out it wasn't the original objective of the study. I acknowledge that. They cut this finding. Miller also had them cut a chunk of the author's note, which would have disclosed that payday lending companies had helped to write the study. Here's a quote from Miller in an email he sent to them. The unnamed payday lenders and the unnamed blind reviewers do not need or want your thanks. It will actually undermine the lenders' objectives in participating in the study if you do so. So that's cool. I I think just the the phrase objective of the study is already just like does not make any sense. You don't make a study with an objective. You study to to find the correct response you know what i mean like if you go into a study quote unquote with an objective you're already skewing it yeah it makes no sense the objective of science is to arrive at the truth through the testing of like observable phenomena not that's what i'm saying yeah exactly it's it's... you don't have an objective going in that doesn't make any fucking sense yeah it's frustrating it's the same people that like fact check fucking scientists when it comes to climate change they just make up their own definitions of what the words facts mean what the word study means and then people just buy into it because they haven't learned this new definition that's incorrect 
Now, Shireen, you may not remember from way back in 2008, but one of the things that President Obama ran on when he was first running for election was that he was going to reform the payday loan industry. Uh, and he spent years and years and years as president uh, having the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau figure out a list of rules that they could kick into place to essentially wipe out the payday loan industry as it currently exists. Uh, and near the end of his term, they finally like hit upon exactly what new restrictions they needed to put in place. Um, now, they announced these restrictions in 2017, and they were expected to reduce payday loan volume by 62%. Um, so this would have been a massive hit to uh, an incredibly slimy industry. However, no, a couple of months ago, the, the new restrictions should have hit in August of 2019. But very recently, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau under President Trump changed course and scrapped most of the proposed changes the Obama administration had spent years putting together and preparing to implement. According to The Motley Fool, quote, the CFPB will gut most of the rules it previously sought, leaving only modest changes to payday lending practices. The one rule that remains impacts lenders' collection of loan payments. Most borrowers pay by automatic bank drafts. Under the new rule, after two failed withdrawal attempts, lenders would have to get authorization for any additional withdrawal attempts. And that's it. Everything else gets to stay. The article also notes... Wait, so, yep. so the things that Obama tried to implement since he was elected in 2008 were... It was going to be in, like until last August, like like eleven years later. Like, it, it, well, I mean, it took like it took, uh, yeah, it took a long time. Um, like, they, like long enough for Trump to overturn it, basically. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, and it's it's worth noting that in April of 2018, not that long before the CFPB changed its rules, the payday loan industry trade group, the Consumer Financial Services Association, held its annual conference. You want to guess where they held their 2018 annual conference? In my butthole? I don't know. No, not not in your butthole, but in the Trump National Doral Golf Court uh, Club in Miami. That's that's the same place. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It is a butthole. That's for sure. Yeah. It's, it's now all of our buttholes. <laughs> <sighs> How you feeling, Shireen? Uh, I I need more therapy. Is what I'm feeling. Uh. Yeah. But you know, there are moments where you have such little faith in humanity. That you're just like, what's the point? Why, why am I still here? Um, and I'm glad that coming onto your show really makes me think of my life as such a meaningless blip in a, in a white man's game. So thank you for that, Robert. Well, you're welcome, Shireen. I, uh, you know, hope is as toxic as cigarettes, according to uh, to most World Health Organization reports. So, Is that in a recent study? Was that their objective to find? Okay, cool. Yeah, it was actually funded by the payday loan industry. Um, oh. so, so you know it's good What if research. this entire episode was just like a huge ad for like the payday loan? Like what if like you were sponsored? Actually, at this point, I would, nothing would surprise me if you were actually, if you were actually like Scott Tucker's son or some shit. Well, like, you know, what? Shireen, if you really do need a short term loan, AmeriCash uh, can, can lend you oh up to a thousand dollars. No questions asked. And interest rates less than 900%, you know, Stop. and that's, that's Stop. pretty low. 900 is a smaller number than a thousand. So you're kind of making bank. Those are numbers that that are smaller than the other. Yeah, yeah. Those are numbers. Those are numbers. That's actually the motto of AmeriCash. You know, you know, um, you know, like when you strain too yes. hard on the toilet and like maybe sure. you pop out a hemorrhoid or two, and your asshole becomes right. unredeemable. You, an, you unredeemable an unredeemable asshole. asshole. That, that is Scott funny. Tucker. Okay. He is an unredeemable asshole, and uh, he's just a. You can't go back after that. You can't. You could, maybe you could tuck in a hemorrhoid or two on a, on a good day, but most of the days they just like have you have a little tag just just flopping in the wind. I might say, and, um, I I'm might, mad. I might say that Scott Tucker, like the whole payday loan industry, is an unredeemable asshole, and Scott Tucker is one particularly flappy hemorrhoid. Yeah, yeah, I like that metaphor. Yeah, and then on on the next episode of the Magic School Bus, we're going to go straight into the asshole. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, oh, we're gonna boy. be the enema the enema going right in before a really uh rigorous uh uh just a night of really crazy strap-on uh pegging um 
I'm pissed. Yeah, then the, when I'm pissed, I talk about butts. So you talk I'm about sorry, pegging a lot everybody. when you're pissed. I'm starting to realize this, which is is dude. Good. Pegging is not don't don't uh don't I'm shame not pegging. Shaming it's pegging. fun. It's a fun. It's a fun time. I'm sure. I'm sure you. I'm sure you'd be open to it. I think I, if I know anything about you, you'd be open to pegging. I have. I have no issues with pegging. Pegging is much more ethical than, for example, the payday loan industry. I uh, agree. And if can we get sponsored by pegging? <laughs> the concept of pegging. Yeah, we'll just try. Just just get a strap-on sponsor. I will. Sell I'm just trying to make myself feel better. I'm trying to make myself feel better after this awful decision I had to come on your show again. So um, I'm thinking of pegging. Well, I'm thinking that next we should talk about Jacob Wall for like an hour. How, do, how does that feel? A nice palate cleanser? Uh, yeah, a nice palate cleanser. I mean, those of you that have been following the show probably remember me from being on the other Grifters episode. Um, and like last week or something, the, the tweets about their, our first episode together with Jacob Wall and the Grifters started getting a lot of like retweets and comments again. So I was like, oh, I guess he's like in the news. So I'm curious what you have for me today for to update me on this on this fucker's life. Well, Shireen, you and I will have that conversation in a matter of minutes. Uh, but for our listeners, it will happen on Thursday when they hear the next episode of Behind the Bastards. So before we break for that, do you want to plug some pluggables, which is different from pegging peggables? Um, you know, anal plugs are also a thing, but not today. Today I'm going to plug uh, the podcast I co-host, Ethnically Ambiguous. It's uh, a fun time. Um, I co-host it with my friend uh, Anna Hosnier. I was going to say Anna, but we call her both. Um, and uh, we talk about Middle Eastern experience in the U.S., being uh, daughters of immigrants. And we also have fun guests on, just like me, that I'm a guest on this one. Um that's what podcasting is. Okay, anyway, you can follow us on Ethnically Amb, AMB on Twitter, Ethnically Amb, Ethnically Ambig, A-M-B-I-G on Instagram, and I'm Shiro Hero on Instagram, S-H-E-E-R-O-H-E-R-O, and Twitter, it's Shiro Hero 666. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode more than I did. And I hope that you enjoyed this episode more than I enjoyed reading about payday loans. Um, you can find me on Twitter at IWriteOK. Okay. You can find this podcast on uh, the Twinstagrams at, at BastardsPod. You can find our website with all the sources for this uh, at BehindTheBastards.com. Uh, I have another podcast called It Could Happen Here, and it's about uh, the Second American Civil War, which after an episode like this seems almost more optimistic than just letting some of this continue, but it's not. It's it can real, happen here. It's a real... It can happen here. Yeah, it could happen here, aspirationally. Um, yeah. But no, it's a super big bummer and very sad. Uh, that's... Oh, you buy t-shirts on tpublic.com. Oh, yeah. Uh, you can also get some payday loans from tpublic.com. Um... So, Enter the code Robert Evans and you'll get like a nine hundred not yeah nine hundred percent versus a thousand percent. Yep, we'll knock a hundred percent off of that interest rate for you. Uh, that's all I got for today. Sophie, would you toss some bagels angrily against the wall for me? She one hundred percent just did that. It ricocheted off the wall and landed right back into her lap. It was a beautiful thing. Physics Fan- is real. Fantastic. Physics is yeah fantastic that was the first remote bagel throwing that i think anyone has ever engaged in so you know we're this is a groundbreaking show this is a groundbreaking show and until next week's groundbreaking episode i love about 40 percent of you